A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Our cases this week, Poison Soup, a TV soap opera star, a senior citizen's alleged attack on a police officer. All of this is part of an outrageous story of a New England woman who allegedly attempted to poison her husband after she was catfished by a scammer that she thought was a TV actor. While no charges have been filed in the alleged poisoning plot, the woman has been charged with assaulting an officer and her husband has not returned home after that soup incident that sent him to the hospital. Now the actor may be a fake, but this sure is sounding like a real life soap opera. But first, justice for a five-year-old boy who was murdered and taken more than 30 years ago. Finally, police have made an arrest. Investigators have charged the boy's father and stepmother. It's a unique case because news cameras were actually rolling when the father shouted he had found his son's body stuffed in a camper on his property. It never sat right with investigators or other family members, but investigators say that new forensic testing has made it possible for them to make these arrests. We are recording this on Wednesday, January 17th of 2024. Our guest today is Luis Bolaños, a law enforcement expert, founder of Get Bit Investigations, a dear friend of the show. You know he's a former homicide detective. Um, Always appreciate your wisdom. And Luis, it's so good to see you. It's been so long. Great to see you too, Anna. Um, It's been a while, so we're, we're working on that. (laughs) <laughs> we may be chatting soon in person. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, yeah. You're so busy, as many of you know, uh, if you're regulars to the podcast, Lewis has been with us from the beginning. We're on our fourth year here on the podcast. And Lewis does a lot of pro bono work, a, a lot of advocacy work for survivors, um, survivors and their families, um, victims' families. And uh, you're super busy, so we're always pleased when you can – you know, make a little time for us to get your insight on these cases. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate being asked. Thank you so much. Um, I, I have to say, whoever uh, will, great job on picking these cases um, because both of them resonate with me, with both of those, actually, Anna, uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but catfishing is a huge problem in this country, huge problem. And using a celebrity as bait, very common. And of course, you and I uh, have a special place in our hearts for cold cases, especially when it involves children. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And so, yeah. All right. Let's get to our top case, which is about the little boy who finally, after 34 years, is going to get a little bit of justice here. Justice delayed, but hopefully not denied in this case. So our first case is out of Monk's Corner, South Carolina, where a father and a stepmother have been charged with the murder of a five-year-old boy. The victim is five-year-old Justin Turner. Justin was reported missing on the afternoon of March 3rd, 1989. Can anyone listening remember where they were in 1989? He'd be like 40 years old now. It really brings it to light. and It's so sad. Another unnecessary uh, killing of of a harmless innocent child uh, it, it just doesn't make any sense but. it doesn't it doesn't no. so you know when this happened at the time the parents gave these these varying accounts of whether justin was or was not on the school bus which was always very troubling to investigators so initially the call was he didn't get off the school bus from home but then apparently no one ever remembered seeing him on the school bus to even get off of it so I think ultimately investigators have determined Justin just never got on that bus. And look, we're parents and you don't have to be a parent to know, right, whether a five-year-old gets on a school bus or not. They're too young to just like be left alone to, to do that. So true. So true. Um, you know, and I think there's there's hopefully law enforcement, because now we know that not only was he not on that school bus ever get on it but he never went obviously didn't go to school that day right i I would hope that would be the first call law enforcement made even though i've seen no indication of that it would be to the school to see if he was even in school if that would have been done early on do you think they'd have an answer early on it took a bit of time 
for this thing to to move forward as as you you tell the, the story the little boy you know whether he got on the school bus or not which was the argument and investigators apparently from the very beginning found that part of the story very very troubling it wasn't adding up um which is also you know if you're going to lie about something that's not a good lie you know it's just not a good one easy to catch so he ultimately is found 2 days later there was a massive search for this little boy because you've got a 5 year old missing and what um is amazing to me is these things don't always happen but there were news cameras rolling at the time as the volunteer and police search teams were going through the area and the family's property looking for the little boy there were you know if you we're going to show the video again back from 1989 for those of you who are listening and it looks like 1989 and you've got sheds and campers and all this stuff and you see all these volunteers out there searching and then this is amazing to me lewis the moment the moment the child's body is found by the father in the family camper is captured on camera in real time and 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 that in itself was always troubling to authorities they found the whole thing suspicious but they couldn't do anything about it at the time uh, we're going to play that clip and then we'll discuss it so um this video was shot by wc bd tv of charleston and this is the point where the father comes out of the camper listen carefully we'll, we'll try to pump the audio for you but he's going to say this is what he says he's in there my son's in there Somebody heard him. Let's play the clip. Oh, something's in there. Nathan, that's no, camera. No camera, no camera. Where's he at? Where's he at? He's in there. He's in there. Everybody stand back. Everybody stand back. So, Lewis, you know, the video continues and he's sitting there on the porch, you know, looks upset. I don't know. He he tells cops he didn't touch the body. He intentionally didn't touch the body. What do you make of this? A few things in which you just described, Anna, that it really caught my attention. First of all, it, I don't. Why did it take so long? Two days to start the search of the immediate property. That's usually one of the first things you do. So hypothetically, if they would have called the school initially, found out he wasn't there, he's not in sight anywhere. He's not where he's supposed to be. Um, and there's something fishy or with the parents where do you, again, you work your way in the closest relatives, family members, uh, friends around the child, around the victim and work your way out. But that search seems like it should have been done much, much sooner. So we don't really know how long it took, uh, for them to put the suspects to put the victim into that camper. Um, if they it, were that child was obviously moved from another place to put in there. Um, and so, I mean, things could have really changed if that would have been done earlier, as far as maybe having a stronger investigation and really having a good case for those responsible. The other thing is that bothers me is they allowed the father to participate in the way he did in this search for his own son. Now, I, I get it. And look, I've been in these scenarios before where it's difficult to keep family members out. And you're always riding a fine line because you want to them, you know, especially if they're innocent and you probably have a bit of that thought in the back of your head at the beginning. Sometimes at, at some point that'll transition early, which I think happened here. But if you're going to let them search, you put that family members in a position where they're not going to be affecting something the worst thing that could happen is if a family member is the one that actually finds the child for a variety of reasons again hard to keep them out of the scenario but we've come up with scenarios to put them at a position during the search where they feel relevant and they're helping and they're doing something but if they find the victim you just made your case a whole lot more difficult you expose the scene so th that really bothered me. And look, we're talking 1989, right? Th that mm -hmm. was a practice that was already in place in law enforcement. This isn't something that I just invented. This is something that was taught to me back in 1984. Um, so that bothered me. So he goes into the shed, into the camper shell, which is what, five by five. This is a truck bed camper, as you can see in the video. It, it takes a minute to find it. And when the father comes out, 
you know, it says, my son's in there. Difficult to hear, but I'd hear, hear it 10 times, but that that's what he said, my son's in there. And then within a few minutes on that same video, if you listen closely, if a few seconds, about 20 seconds, you hear a female say, how did he know? Or how did they know? Um, so immediately, that was the first thought from law enforcement on the scene. They were already wondering how this person knew. Um, so Yeah, it is very it's, suspicious. It's, yeah. Yeah. And it's so troubling. And, you know, back then there really weren't home security cameras in 1989, you know, didn't really have the Internet. Uh, a lot of a lot of things that we don't have now, they did not have in 1989. So the fact that the news cameras were rolling at this very moment is priceless. Right. It, you don't usually see that, but especially when the, the find happens, when you, when you found your, your goal, your subject. Yeah. Um, and there was some discussion that maybe the camper had been searched, like they had gone through the property and hadn't found him. So that does raise the question that you've brought up. I don't think it's believed that he was killed in there. It's believed he was placed there. So the question is, when was he placed in there? At what pl point in this search for the child? So Anna, well, Anna, what do you think would have happened? Because it very easily could have happened if the father would have gone in there to search and just done a cursory search and claim, he, even though he knows the boy's in there, and just came out and said, nothing here, closed it. Do you think the search would have moved on? Yes. Would there, would there, could there have been a redundant search behind him? Probably not at that point. Um, yeah. It, it, that this whole investigation would have changed. So, yeah, Very when you have suspicious. a person of interest, in, in fact, at that time, they were considered suspects, person of interest, and evolve until the last, what, 20 years? Um but we have person of interest. You don't want to put them in those situations because you just you're tainting the scene, the the, the investigation. Um, oh, it's it was it's truly a horrific crime. Truly a horrific crime. So the people charged here are Victor Buddy Lee Turner, who is now 69 years old. We're showing his mug shot. You can see he's got um, oxygen tubes under his nose, and his wife Megan, who was previously called Pamela Turner, she changed her name. Uh, she's 63, and they were arrested last week and charged with killing the boy. Sheriff S. Dwayne Lewis held a news conference with family members to announce the break in this cold case. I want you to listen to the sheriff. Here's a clip. Justin never made it to school that morning. He never got on the bus. He never arrived at school. That's because he had been murdered. And he'd been murdered by his stepmother and his father and left in a camper behind their house. I can't think of a more tragic, horrendous murder. Five-year-old boy. The sheriff says that suspicion was always on the father and the stepmother. And what's interesting here is there have been multiple sheriffs since Justin's body was found. And so, you know, the case has languished. And then about a year and a half ago, the sheriff said that the cold case took it on seriously and decided maybe there was some evidence that could be retested and now with new forensic technology that this would shed some light on things. They also did analysis of his stomach contents and um, additional testing to try to see if they could zero in on the time of death. And um, they always knew that the little boy had been strangled. And then he was also sexually assaulted. It's a horrific end to this child's life. But, uh, they eventually felt that they had enough information early on to make an arrest or to file charges on mom. And at some point, for unknown reason to today, they dropped the charges on her. Right. That's shortly after that is when her and her husband left the area. They moved three hours away. Um, and there's some indication here the law enforcement found them difficult to find or to, to or to have them participate in the investigation. Um, they made, The sheriff, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Dwayne Lewis, he, he made a comment uh, on, on the press conference that uh, yeah, they moved away. She changed her name, and you make of that what you want. But she, they didn't 
in the 35 years they were gone, they never called. They didn't want to participate in the investigation. They never called it to, to ask us what's going on, where it stands. My goodness, it's their son, her stepson, his biological son. Why wouldn't that have happened? And I think that's an interesting point, and you do have to think of that. But the other side of that coin is you just arrest, you just file charges on her early on. So she most likely got an attorney. What's an attorney going to advise her at that time? Look, they think you're a suspect. They didn't drop this case because they've cleared you. They dropped this and they think you're innocent. They dropped it because they didn't have enough to proceed. So her not responding, the family responding for 35 years, most likely is on the advice of the attorney saying, do not speak to law enforcement, do not speak to media, do not <laughs> say a thing because everything you say can't and will be used against you in a court of law. So that may be a big part of their silence, um, but most likely it was the latter. Uh, they mm -hmm. didn't want to get involved because, you know, they knew their time might be short. Not so, short enough, though, you know, because yeah. as the the other family members who want nothing to do with this couple that's been charged, they continued to work and press authorities to try and keep this case open and active open and active to get justice for this little boy. Because it's just, it isn't okay for someone to get away with the murder of a child, anyone's murder. But this one in particular just really bothered this community intensely. So while investigators at the time were always suspicious of the father and the stepmother because of the changing stories about the school bus and a, and a whole lot of other things, the sheriff um, did address the whole finding the boy's body in the camper moment. And and the sheriff says he believed, they believed at the time and they believe to this day that it was a performance. Here's another clip from the sheriff's news conference. When you look at the scene, you can, you can assume by looking at it that it was somewhat a staged scene, scene to make it look like something that it wasn't. And um, all that'll come out. We'll, we'll get to all that. But there's a lot of inconsistencies in the story and the information in what the deputies, detective, and sled agents, DNR agents were told when they first got there to try to piece the thing together. So, Lewis, that's interesting. The sheriff says staged to make it look like something it wasn't. Yeah, what uh, what was the diversionary tactic here that the father threw into this investigation? Well, I think in the simplest form, it's just participating in the search. And we see that a lot in these type of cases where the actual suspect is there during the search and, and wants, is dying hard to participate because they think he gives them some blanket of, of uh, innocence. Um, and it, it does it. Law enforcement is trained to look at individuals that really force themselves to be on the scene. And once the parent, you still have to balance that. Uh, but yeah, he feigned it. He absolutely faked it. Uh, it, it. Now, you know, of course we have Monday morning quarterback, but it just seemed very insincere, the finding of his own son that, you know, and he didn't go pick him up. He didn't touch him. In fact, he makes sure he makes sure to tell the sheriff investigators early on that he didn't touch him. <laughs> right. And some of his statements, to, even the sheriff made a comment about that at the uh, press conference. The father said, Justin looked dead. Well, taken in context, that's a true statement mm -hmm. by itself. He also said he felt, the father felt that something was wrong with him. Again, taken by itself in context, a true statement. Um, and when he said, I did not touch him, right? That's a true statement also. So the father, I think, is using these, what thought he was using, again, this these true statements to create, you know, part of his 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 feigning a part of his present false presentation. Um, but it just, uh, no, it didn't look good. And I think that re resonated very quickly. And like I said earlier, within seconds of saying, saying that somebody on the scene, you can hear it on the video says, how did he, how did they know they were there? He was there. Excuse me. Yeah. How did I, I yeah. would have been screaming my head off inside the camper before I even had my hand on the door to open it to say I'd found him. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, it, and look, we've seen it the other side of it, too. The flip side of it is I have seen people wrongfully accused 
Yes. Because they did go pick up the individual who was bloodied and got blood all over them. And, you know, and then law law enforcement shows up and they think that's a big indicator. Well, it is, but you, again, you have to take it in context and you have to work through that. Um, so, it, you know, in this case, I, it was pretty indicative that uh, he didn't want to get near his own son. When authorities examined Justin's body, they found ligature marks on his neck indicating that it was strangulation. Examiners determined that it was for sure homicide. This was not an accident. And they always thought he probably died around the time that he was reported missing, as opposed to, you know, maybe he was missing the day before, um, you know, as if it was perhaps a more hurried thing. And they confirmed that he had been sexually assaulted either before or at the time of his death, which I thought was interesting about the timing of it. Yeah, it, it is very interesting. And think about it. One of the statements that the mother made to law enforcement early on was part of a story that she went and took a shower and that Justin got on the bus during that time. Well, part of that might be true. Maybe she did take a shower, but the reason for that shower might because as she described, she said she had an altercation with Justin. And who has an altercation with a five-year-old? I get parenting, right? But that's a pretty bizarre word to me to, to use that. Um, but that shower might have been to help get rid of some evidence that was on her. Um, yeah. You know, so. So both parents took a lie detector polygraph tests at the time that Justin's body was discovered, but no details or the results of that polygraph were ever released. Uh, we have had so many conversations about polygraphs. You have very strong opinions about them. And so we, but we don't know what the results of them are here. And then I would make an argument, polygraphs in 1989 versus polygraphs now, science has moved forward. Yeah. Yeah. I would also say that most likely we don't know the results of it. They, they didn't release that law enforcement did not. Um, and I think that's a good thing, but even more importantly, the suspects don't know the results of it. And even if they were told by the polygraph examiner at the time, that uh, you passed it doesn't mean that's true. Yeah. It's um, fascinating that they did, as you mentioned, charge the stepmother and then drop the charges. And that seemed like that was it. It went off to the cold case. So then there was a major break, according to the sheriff, in April of 2021. And um, so... According to authorities, they were able to establish a link between the fibers that were found on Justin's body and those identified in the home and around the ligature that was used to strangle him. So they did some additional forensic testing on that. They also were able to narrow down the time of Justin's death based on the content of his stomach. And, you know, it's these haunting words of the father when he came out of the camper. I can't stress this enough. Quote, he's in there. My son's in there. Somebody's hurt him. Okay. And then he adds, he looked dead. I could feel that something was wrong with him. I did not touch him. Okay. So that's it in a nutshell in that moment of real time. So what's interesting is that a witness testified that they overheard the father asking an officer at the time, what would happen if someone, potentially a family member, was responsible for the boy's death. Yeah, that is about the weirdest question and about the last thing that would be on my mind if my son were missing. Yeah, absolutely. And to specifically say family member. So I, I, I yes, that's a huge flag. But it, it's interesting because is he talking about his wife? Right, she's the one that was arrested. They had enough yeah. to arrest her, not him. But he was absolutely still in the mix. So I, I think it'll, it's going to be interesting when it comes out what his involvement was. Was it after the fact? And they haven't said anything yet, which is fascinating. The sheriff made a big point of saying, you know, it was a three and a half hour ride in patrol cars to get those two from the arrest point to where they were going to be booked, and not a word. 
And as the sheriff said, um, he made it really clear, their Miranda rights had been read, so anything that they would have said in the car would have and could have been used against them. And he said, great opportunity to talk for three and a half hours, but not a word out of these two. So yeah, as it, I said, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that, you know, that that it, it's interesting. But again, they didn't say a word for 35 years. They stayed out of it. So they were continuing their pattern of not speaking with law enforcement was three more hours. So that that's not <laughs> surprising. No, good point there, Lewis. So as I said, the family, the rest of the family, good people wanting justice for their for their loved one. Um, they were standing behind the sheriff at this news conference. And Justin's cousin, Amy Parsons, who was just eight years old when her cousin was murdered. So the little boy was five. She was eight. As you can imagine, you have very strong memories of your little cousins and growing up. Here's what she had to say. From here, all we want is justice. And I want to see our justice system do what it was intended to do and put these two people where they deserve to be because they've walked for 34 years. They've had freedom for 34 years. Well, our family has suffered and they don't deserve another day. I think in addition to the injustice for this little boy is what the cousin said. They have had 34 years to live their life, to enjoy the sunshine on their face, to open a Christmas present in the morning, to have a cup of coffee when you feel like it. It's not right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's the passion that hopefully the investigators took because it's not right. Um, you know, I, I find it, it, it should have never happened. It should, I don't know why it took so long to get to the point they're at now, because the sheriff's press concert conference talk saying that it's because forensic evidence has improved the technology. And well, it has, but the stuff you're talking about has been around for quite a few years. Uh, so, you know, it takes somebody who has a passion to reopen and get in, to get excited and passionate about investigating something, especially involving a five-year-old. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I think those are tough questions that need to be asked, but I don't think that department is alone with cases like this, Anna. We know of other cases we've worked that have been cold for so long, and the only reason they get fired up, if they really do, it takes a lot to get them re fired up again. Um, so... You know, maybe there were some other forms of investigators assigned to this case over the years, but they just didn't prioritize it and didn't see what they had. But based on the evidence that they're claiming to, to hang their case on, that stuff has been around for, I want to say, 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, sometimes it's like pieces of a puzzle. Yeah. You just reorganize them, you put them mm -hmm. in different perspective, and then maybe you have a few extra witnesses and maybe some more supporting forensics to the original evidence. And then somehow it just lines up and feels stronger that can maybe can make it through the threshold. Because here's the other thing that we don't talk about this a lot. You know, we always say, you know, the police, the police, and they, you know, they haven't arrested anyone. Police have to turn their case over to prosecutors. And so you have sometimes conflicting political wills at work where you have an agency that wants to charge and then you have a prosecutor there's like i can't prosecute this and that happens a lot it's it, that behind it the scenes fight between law enforcement agencies to get a case to this point now i'm not saying that prosecutors did that in this case but you know it just could have been enough where everything aligned just the right way to make it possible to do this. Things definitely had to align apparently, but you bring up a great point because that's exactly what happened, right? Back when initially Megan uh, Renee Turner was arrested, right? They, they made an arrest and they dropped the charges. Law enforcement dropped the charges and never gave reason to it. And I, you know, it's not brain surgery. They dropped the charges because they had a discussion with the prosecutors at some point, we don't have enough to go forward. Um, and we want to be able to bring them back when we have enough evidence. So they may have jumped the gun then. I mean, you have to, it's the right mix. Uh, it, it happens a lot. But, you know, Anna, with, with this evidence taking so long to be tested, this case to be re reinvigorated, makes you wonder, well, we know how many other cases are out there like this. that are just as shocking. They're on a shelf that it just takes somebody. Let me look at that again. Like, like you just said, maybe our team could put 
a, the puzzle together in a different way uh, and the pieces together and make this make sense. Uh, it, you know, I think it's, you know, one of the cases that we have the easiest time getting a community to rally and care about this is when it involves a child. Yeah. So right away, those cases should be some of the ones you you bring to the forefront because you can rally the troops to community to, to, to back you up and to move this thing forward. And we've used our technique, uh, you and I both, and I've done that with, with other cases. Um, and it works. People care. They just need to be made aware of what's happening. If they didn't make this arrest now or they didn't put it under a, a microscope in a cold case, um, this thing may have never gone solved. Well, I'm glad the charges have been brought. Of course, they are presumed innocent. Yes. They have not yes. entered a plea yet. Uh, they're both being held in a detention center in Berkeley County. But for Justin's sake, I hope that this is justice and that they have the right people. Agree. A new year always comes with new resolutions. So get a kickstart on your goals with Factor. Factor's ready-to-eat meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success. Skip the grocery stores, the prep work, and the cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. With over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart vegan veggie and more you will have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart those resolutions factors no prep no mess meals freeze up time that you'd otherwise have to spend shopping cooking and cleaning up plus factor now offers loads of snack options like breakfast smoothies juices and snacks another thing i love factor is flexible you can change your order up every week with plans from four to 18 meals per week or pause or reschedule your deliveries at any time. Head to factormeals.com slash truecrime50 and use the code truecrime50 to get 50% off. That's a lot. That's code truecrime50 at factormeals.com slash truecrime50 to get 50% off. Our next case is just bizarre. I mean, it is truly a soap opera. So it's about a woman in Townsend, Maryland, who claims that she was catfished by a scammer posing to be a soap opera star. Now, the scammer somehow, th this is how it's being reported, inspired her to maybe, maybe poison, this is very important because testing so far doesn't support it, inspired her to maybe poison her husband, say police. It's unclear if the husband was poisoned. Police said that she made a batch of soup. She doesn't seem to deny making soup for the man and that he became ill. He became unconscious, had to go to the hospital, but he is alive and now very understandably refusing to go home to the wife. And uh, she's been ordered to leave the man alone. So I, it, it's just got so many levels here. Uh, and I know Especially when you've got the catfishing, you've got the the poser, the who's fake, and then you've got the husband, the text messages. We're going to try and sort this out because it's so confusing. So police say 64-year-old Roxanne Doucette is under investigation, not charged, for allegedly attempting to poison her husband, Paul Doucette, who was 73. So he was about 10 years older. And soup would have been the weapon here, alleged. Somehow Roxanne found herself, this is the part I still don't understand, on an, she had this online relationship with a scammer who's posing to be a soap opera star. And, and that when they started their virtual affair, he told her to get rid of her husband, but he also demanded money from her, which she did give to him. So this is just like a ton of levels of things going on here. And none of this was revealed or uncovered, I should say, until Paul goes to the hospital on December, December 1st, 2023, with this mystery illness. He was, again, he was not conscious and he ultimately survives, but it's at the hospital where the plot, alleged plot, and all this other stuff came undone. What do you make of this, Lewis? You know, people wonder, well, how could you fall victim to something like this and be gaslighted so easily and believe 
you know, you're talking this soap opera star, this, the gaslighter pretended to be a very popular soap opera star. Um, and I've seen people and I've had cases where victims of gaslighting, it, it's amazing how, how slow and focused and diligent this, the gaslighters are into building their relationship with the victim. It's usually for financial reasons. And I have seen victims because eventually they're going to get to, Hey, I need money. You know, I love you. I want to marry you. And, and you know, this big star and you know, they, you know, you have to, it, they build this incredible relationship where there's the trust is there. Yeah. I'll send it. What do you want? And they actually send money and continue to send it. I, I've had cases where even after we've proven to them by contacting the actual, uh, a list so, celebrity, celebrity, yeah, uh, and asking them, "Are you talking to this person or speaking with their security team?" Uh, no. So you have to you actually you have to do that first. You have to make sure that it's not the actual person. It, I've never found it to be the case. I don't think you know. Probably out there somewhere it's happened, but um, you have to make sure that person not involves it in any way, shape, or form. But you also want to make sure the celebrity or their security team. They don't have information. Maybe they have somebody already who started this. They know exactly who you're dealing with. Um, and that's a good many, point that sometimes uh, if you do, if you pull the scam enough times and you use the same celebrity um, as your fake person, that yeah. that all of a sudden it's gotten back to the celebrity and the team. It's like, there. this is so-and-so who's been accused of doing this in this state, this state, and this state. Um Oh my gosh, yeah. it's so yeah. complicated. I, I know many departments that have units specifically, specifically for gaslighting victims when they're using celebrities. That um, it, it's a it's a huge issue in this well all over the world. <laughs> it's it's everywhere. Um, yeah. And it, so my point was that even after I we proved it to a victim, <laughs> they continue the conversations after they've been told this is fake, but they don't care. They want to live in this fantasy land. What for whatever reason, and they continue this online communication and continue to send money. Sometimes, um, right. it, 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 there's so many issues on both sides levels that that help fuel this fire where it's you just make yourself more of a victim. Um, What's but, troubling about this case is um, so you have what appears to be uh, a woman who has been scammed and did give money over, but the question is, did this alleged virtual affair and scam? then escalate to attempted murder. And that is the part which authorities are trying to figure out and have not charged her because there are text messages and things that she wrote that have the authorities very worried. And then you have the man, the husband, in the hospital ill. So there's certainly enough, um, enough suspicion here that this has to be investigated further. Yeah, a a absolutely. Part of the reason that uh, I keep seeing over and over and everything has been reported is, like as you mentioned, that they didn't find anything in the chemical examination that they did at the hospital. But I also saw the daughter say it, that it was a very small uh, uh, focus on chemicals, that she believes they only focused on op opiates, heroin, and there was something else, the third one. Like a prescription and, thing, like thinking that yeah. something, he had mixed something at, at yeah. his age, right. They, they ne Right. And so they never checked the spectrum because as when <laughs> of you had a chance to, to exam take her blood, did they save a sample? And many times they don't. They just take the blood for that initial test and they don't save any. So you, you get one bite at that apple. But you were, if you know that this person may be a victim of poisoning, you're going to change your whole analysis of, of what you're uh, looking for. Um, so they may have missed that opportunity. And that's interesting because he, the wife does call 911. He gets rushed to the hospital. And what is unclear to us is, and again, she's not been charged. And it's not even clear whether he was poisoned. But... If based on her writings that we're going to get into and her text messages, if she allegedly did poison him, she would have had an opportunity at the hospital to say something and direct 
the investigation, the, the medical investigation, meaning, and the treatment, if that were so. Do you know what I mean? Like, you right. have a golden moment here. You either do the right thing. If you've done the wrong thing, you get a chance to do the right thing. Did she or didn't she? We don't have that information. No, I, she definitely had an ability to direct the doctors in a certain yeah. direction. Um, yeah. And there you go. She wasn't really a suspect yet. Until, exactly. Until and, she's in a conversation with her daughter and her daughter's like, Mom, what do you mean you gave um, a guy $8,000? That's how the whole thing starts. Dad's in the hospital. Daughter goes to see the mother, having a conversation. Mother probably is now, you know, very upset. And now she's finally uh, confessing, well, you know, I have a friend. He's an actor. He needed money. I gave him 8000 Daughter's like, oh, my God, Mom, what have you done? Let me see your phone. And the daughter's like looking to, 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 to the conversation to figure out what's gone on because she's going to call the police because her mother has now been scammed out of $8,000 and she wants the police to investigate. And then when she calls the police to investigate and they come to the hospital, the conversation <laughs> takes quite a turn when based on the text messages, it now appears as if there have been some conversations about getting rid of the husband. And he's in the hospital with a mystery illness. Yeah, yeah. It, the light went on pretty quick for the daughter. I, wow. I just can't imagine her the battle in her mind um, because she reports that, just that, to law enforcement. Right? And, and because of her, she rang the bell. And now this is going to be investigated, is being investigated. Uh, at what a, you know, a, the daughter most likely had a history of events, other factors that we don't know about yet that made her come to that conclusion so early on. Um, yeah, the statements are are uh, concerning. They were texted to each other, oh but many of, them, many of them by themselves, taken in context, could be a true statement. It's still yeah. totality. Yeah. Right. That's what we don't know. So, okay. The soap opera star that Roxanne thought she was having an affair with uh, was pretending to be Thorsten K, an actor known for his roles in soap operas like All My Children, The Bold, and The Beautiful. Okay, so that's who he was pretending to be. Okay, so he wanted to hook up with Roxanne and there were these flirtatious messages. And aside from the alleged physical interest that he seemed to have in Roxanne here of Townsend, Maryland, um, predictably asked Roxanne for money. So she gave him $8,000. That is a sizable amount. It's not as much as we've seen in other scams, but let's face it, $8,000 is a serious amount of money here. And the daughter, Nicole Heath, um, is is the one who kind of uncovers this, as we said, in real time at the hospital. Okay, so as she's going through the text messages on her mother's phone, she like sees these steamy messages between her mother and this guy. Okay, so that's really jarring for an adult child. I don't care what age you are. You're like, mom, what are you doing here? Then she sees the $8,000. And then she sees or she reads and interprets how the scammer wanted the father either out of the way or dead. So let's get to the text messages. So in these text messages, you have things like the scammer writing to Roxanne, you have to get rid of your husband, honey. I need you so much. Roxanne responds, let me do some thinking. Then, according to police, Roxanne texts the fraudster again. This would be about 2.30 on the day that Paul goes to the hospital. And she texts, Making an amazing soup, special potion. He will be hungry when he gets back, just enough for him. Then, about an hour and a half later, the scammer again reaches out to Roxanne and says, he misses her. And he says, honey, will you still be able to get the money? And then Roxanne responds, well, don't know. Okay, the scammer is persistent and follows up with Roxanne at about 4.30 that afternoon. And he writes, honey, please, you have, to look a, you have to look for a way, honey. I want you. I want us to meet before it's too late. So these two haven't even met. 
Police say that the woman responds, right? She responds, Roxanne, and she writes, quote, Hubby got back, not feeling well. Maybe I can collect life insurance. Oh, boy. Yeah, how about that? And, and look, Anna, the, 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 if you've been a victim of, uh, of gaslighting, you, you never meet the person. It never happens. No, right? because they don't exist. They don't exist. Uh, so finally, Ra- Roxanne, at 510, remember the last text message she sends is at 430 saying, maybe she can collect life insurance. Okay. <laughs> Within almost 45 minutes, she's on the phone with 911 reporting that her husband is still breathing but unresponsive. She told the dispatcher that Paul was dizzy, sitting in a chair, mumbling, not making sense. Toxicology reports show negative, again, not because it was a full test, but they were focused, as you said, on things like opioids, cocaine, alcohol, other things, prescription drugs. So the amazing thing is then it's the unraveling of the rest of this case. So now you've heard the text messages, which is really troubling. So the daughter calls the police. Police go to the hospital and Roxanne agrees to sit down and talk with the cops about what happened. So she's now explaining all of this, how she's been ripped off, but she says, I didn't poison my husband. And the cops, when they're talking to Roxanne, ask, you know, for her cell phone and her tablet. And then they say, this is going to the police, we need to take these as evidence. And Roxanne doesn't like that. So the cops say, She gets into a physical fight with the cops over over her um, iPad and her cell phone and and kicks them. And so, therefore, they charge her with assaulting an officer and resisting arrest. She actually kicked the cop in the crotch. Um, so <laughs> she's Love facing makes no you do funny too. things, Lewis. Love yeah. makes you do funny things. Can you believe this? So here's Roxanne in the middle of all this. The husband, can you imagine? This really is a soap opera. The husband is in the hospital. And cops have just been, you know, kicked in the nuts. <laughs> and you've got this feisty woman who thinks she's going to run away with some actor who's like dying to live with her. And she's just, oh my God, what a mess. I, 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 so Roxanne denies any attempts on her husband's life. She claims that the soup she served may have been old. She insists that she didn't poison him. Now, Roxanne's life, not so great right now, because even though she has not been charged with an attempted murder here or poisoning or anything like that, she does have all these other charges. And get this, the judges said, Roxanne, you cannot have any contact with your husband and leave your daughter alone. You can't contact her either. But does Roxanne listen? No. What does Roxanne do? According to the police, she starts writing them letters. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to explain she, she, she didn't do anything. She actually wrote a letter and stuck it in with the bills, her bills, and had a neighbor deliver it. Um, so she's, you know, that, that's pretty indicative that, that she's thinks like that. Right. It's um, all about Roxanne. Or, I'm yeah, sorry, it's all about Roxanne. So she has done a few interviews with TV reporters, which I find fascinating. Oh, she, yeah, oh, she won't say no. Right. She won't right. shut up. She will not shut up, which I don't think is getting her any sympathy. But there's one that I, I uh, particularly found interesting, and this is a clip from WBZ TV. And um, here's Roxanne at the door talking to a reporter. I've never, ever tried to poison him in any way whatsoever i love him very very much and i would never try to kill anyone i just want him to come home i just love him so much okay if you were paul would you come home to this no i think i'm good i think that's a deal breaker (laughs) (laughs) i think i'm safer wherever i am yeah um yeah, you know, it was actually Paul that he rang the bell early on with law enforcement when he, as soon as he felt good enough that his wife had a history of mental problems and abusing prescriptions. So that may be, may have been one of the reasons why they felt comfortable at least early on with just the small uh, evaluation of the medication or the blood, mm-hmm. the 
blood. Uh, but there's a history there. there. There's something there that made her, helped make her a perfect victim. Because she is a victim of the catfishing. Yeah, of the scammer. Absolutely, yeah, she so, is. So she is a victim of that. Um, and which I hope, and I, I'm sure law enforcement is doing their best, not to go, just to go after him for the financial crime and catfishing he did on on the wife, but also as a participant in the homicide. If they're going to go after her homicide, they have to do everything they can to go after him. him. Her, who we don't even who know knows who it is. We have yeah, no idea. Knows, right? So we, uh, you know, I there there were things they they could have done early on. They may they probably did to try to identify this person. And many I times, just want to know how they connected. Yeah. How did Roxanne yeah. and the poser connect? I I I haven't been able to find that. There's a lot that you know. Police are telling everyone not to judge, not to judge. Um, because it's the talk of the town. I mean, you can't go to the supermarket without having a discussion about this case because it really is. It's so unusual. And she keeps going on television. So it's not like it's going to go away. The more you talk about it, the more other people are going to talk about it. So she has, um, so she is on release for the witness intimidation and battery. Um, she is prohibited contact with her daughter must stay away 100 yards from her husband. She also has a GPS monitor, remains on house arrest, which of course, you know, that's why she opens the door to the reporter and does the interviews right there in the doorway. Okay. But like I said, Roxanne, she's having some problems here. On December 12th, this would be, you know, almost two weeks later, she is again arraigned because she violated the terms of her release by writing that letter to her husband, you know, I miss you, I miss you, I miss you. She was released with the same conditions, but again, it was a violation. So Roxanne is not doing herself any favor if she wants any judge or jury to believe, you know, she's having a hard time here. So she's scheduled to be back in court on February 8th for a pre-trial hearing. I got to tell you, this is one of those cases I really want to follow because it's just so weird. Let's be real. Investing can be intimidating, so intimidating that sometimes it feels easier to just push it off. If you can identify with that, today's sponsor might be just the thing to kick you into gear. Today's episode is sponsored by Acorns. Acorns helps you automatically save and invest for your future. You don't need a lot of money to get started. You can even start by investing your spare change with Roundups. The app even gives you access to education and guidance to learn more about investing. Head to acorns.com slash true crime to sign up for acorns to start saving and investing for your future today. Investing involves risk, including the loss of principal. Please consider your objectives, risk tolerance, and acorns fees before investing. Acorns Advisors LLC is an SEC registered investment advisor. Brokerage services are provided to clients of acorns by acorns securities LLC member FINRA SIPC. For more information, visit acorns.com. All right, it is time for our comments section. These are crime cases you all are talking about on social media. And here's our producer, Will Updike. Hey, Will. Hey, Anna. Hey, Lewis. Great to see you. Good to see you. Hi, Will. Good to see you. All right. So uh, this week's case, we have a white wedding turned into a black and white striped wedding. This case comes out of Toluca, Mexico, where a bride's wedding photo made waves after she was arrested and booked in her wedding dress. Now, uh, the bride in this case, who's only been identified as Nancy Ann, was arrested on her wedding day, as I said, and charged in an extortion ring that involves her husband-to-be as well as six other suspects. So the groom, who's been identified as Clemente N, goes by the alias of Raton or the mouse. Ooh, uh, Raton. All right, this is getting bad now. It's Yeah, it's getting serious. It's getting serious. That's a serious name. Uh, so the bride and groom are alleged associates of a criminal syndicate called El Borrego with in this uh, syndicate syndicate has reported ties to a drug cartel and this cartel as that, all good that, ones do i mean if you're going to be a legit syndicate come on now yeah and this this uh cartel that the syndicate is allegedly linked to is renowned for its brutality they're accused of a drone attack on a small village that blew up a vehicle it charred five people to death earlier this oh month like really crazy serious stuff but this criminal group itself is a little different that the bride and groom were allegedly involved in el borrego had a sort of interesting scheme here where they extorted chicken and egg merchants so this money uh was well delivered. you know with the price of eggs at one point i could make an argument for this was a good financial move right because yeah. that was worth a lot 
Yeah. So they're uh, they're extorting these people. The money is, you know, delivered to the men in the El Borrego group under the threat of violence. Um, and now and it's sort of another note here, while authorities apprehended Nancy Ann and a few others, as I said, there's at least six others identified in this scheme. The groom, Clemente, flees the scene. He's reportedly still on the run for, from authorities. Look out for for uh, the El Raton uh, if you're if you're in the area. But uh, a little note on how this kind of whole scheme worked uh, with these chicken and egg extortions. Uh, you know, Mexico Mexico prosecutors have really been attempting to curb extortion. Uh, there's been a reported decrease in nearly three and a half percent in 2023 alone, and this three and a half percent is a big deal. Criminal groups are starting to feel the squeeze of these efforts. It's resulted in estimated losses of around 47 million million dollars for these uh for these criminal groups and uh el borrego specifically they were charging a fee of about two pesos per kilo on the chicken and eggs that they sell and then forcing the retailers to also pay ab about five pesos per kilo on these chicken and eggs um so I'm, I'm not quite sure the math of how that all works out but it seems it seems fairly significant in the wrong in the long run i'm you know i i, I feel like i hadn't known about this necessary like avenue of, of these criminal syndicates lewis any idea why they're targeting like these you know like ranchers and retailers and stuff like that they target everybody right anybody that has money and potential of, of donating to their their organization it, it, it they target everybody so uh, and i think if they identified the individual and their nature of this is somebody that can actually be manipulated to participate or uh, to contribute they will they just they're very very good at that Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, yeah that makes sense. They use their I, I, type. Sure. You know, some some of you may not know, but Lewis was undercover in Central America with DEA. Oh, wow. yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. In there, the, uh, yes. The yeah. many and lives of Lewis Bolaños. <laughs> yeah, there's a few. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I, you know, you remind me that of a story about 15 years ago when I was still at the DEA's office uh, as an investigator. Uh, we had a homicide suspect uh, who had fled to Mexico. And a really interesting case, but the short version is we couldn't find him in the state. Just couldn't. He had fled back to Mexico. And uh, the way we found him was uh, he sent wedding invitations to all his friends here in the U.S. And they couldn't wait to hand those over to me. So we went to his wedding in Mexico and yanked him before he got to walk down the aisle in his tuxedo with his bride and family chasing us out of there. You have to be very tactical, but uh, that, that resonates. That remind, remind me of that case. Um, and at that time, uh, the Mexican government was very willing to participate to protect us um, because it, it's 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 a unique case. Um, and it was cartel connected, of course, um, but uh, we were able to get him and, and bring him back. And he's doing time now. Uh, but wow, Lewis. That, that, that one, so, yeah. Well, oh that, I mean, we actually got a comment kind of asking. Tech Rock said, I wonder if LE law enforcement did it on purpose. So is this just sort of an easy way to get everybody together? Or it's just like, you know, because you're sending out invitations and stuff, it, everybody knows where your whereabouts are going to be? Uh, no, I think he was really getting married. It was yeah, an actual yeah. invitation and he was sending it to his family. He felt that we were going to come to pull him off his, uh, the stage. It was one place where we knew he was going to be. And we also had other ways of confirming that this wedding was actually going to happen. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, we committed and it worked out. Uh, this wow. photo, that, like, as I said, this photo is, is kind of what drew me to the case. It's really interesting. You have, you know, your, your bride here in cuffs. There's a couple of agents next to her. Uh, yeah, said why they got a pose with her though. I, I'm I'm unsure why the why the agents are in the photo. We don't usually see mug si mug shots like that here uh, stateside, but it's definitely an interesting one. PZ said she definitely had a wedding night. She'll never forget. Yeah, can't. I mean, it doesn't get much more memorable than that. Um, that's him. Officer had a great one. They said whole new meeting in the cupping season, which I you know. Um, and then we, we got to end this one with a pun. New year, new puns. You know what we do in the comments section. Kelly A said, I wonder what kind of egg excuses she and the others arrested will come up with. I cannot believe the groom flew the coop and left his hen behind to take the rap. Oh, um, there's a lot there. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Egg excuses. That's excuses. That's, that's great. Flew the coop. Uh, <laughs> 
But uh, cool. that'll do it for this week's comment section. Thank you so much to everybody who sent those in. You can do that over on our YouTube community page. You can also reach out to us anytime. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, until next week. Don't we thank have to say so X now? We can't call it Twitter anymore. Are you like I'm bucking saying, the system? You're not. I'm still you're not. Twitter. You're not doing it. You're I'm like screw I'm you, never, Elon. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm never saying X. It's never getting called that. Um, <laughs> It's a bad name. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> You're taking on Elon Musk. <laughs> yes. Yes. Personally. Um, okay. All let's right. hope I have the resources to do so. Uh, yes. But that'll do it. And I will see you all next week. I will. Oh, Lewis, I could talk to you forever about your previous lives in law enforcement. Maybe we could just do a podcast where that's all we do is talk about that. It's so fascinating. Your life is amazing. And you're like the nicest human being on the planet, you know? There are so many cases like this, not just that I had the fortune to be involved in, but these type of cases that, that I described are, and thinking outside of the box like that goes on every day. It's amazing uh, the the ability law enforcement has to think outside of the box and then the, to actually do it and do things that sound bizarre to others, but at the time sounds like a great idea. Right? Yeah. Well, it's that's awesome. what I've always appreciated about you. For those of you who don't know, Lewis and I met on assignment for Crime Watch Daily, I don't know, what, five, six years ago. I can't even remember. I remember the case vividly. Um, and it's because you use these techniques to try and get information from people as an investigator now, as a private investigator on some of these cases that you work, that I always find like that's what I think is so novel about you. You know, besides, I think, you know, you have a disposition about you which makes people comfortable to talk. But that doesn't mean someone's going to spill the beans and confess to you just because you appear to be a nice person, you know. <laughs> They're not that I, dumb. I appreciate that. But most of what I do and what I, and the techniques I, we apply are things that I learned, I learned in law enforcement. Um, we just constantly re retweaking them um but no i appreciate that it, but th that kind of stuff is going on all the time you'll find very few private investigators doing that yeah uh, but uh yeah we've been justice in the right direction that's a absolutely well lewis it's always a pleasure to have you you are truly like uh for all our regular listeners and viewers you are you know you're one of our favorites. Uh, everyone enjoys the conversation and they always comment about how it's so easy for the two of us to talk because we really are friends and we really do have these conversations about cases all we the really time. Do. We really <laughs> so do. it's a I very a natural few, progression. I have a few more I'm going to talk to you about soon. Yeah, I know. As it. soon as we're done recording this, we're we getting do. on the phone. I know. All right. Well, Lewis, where can people find you, follow you, all that good stuff? Thank you, Anna. My entire social media footprint is at getbitinvestigations.com. All right, there you go. It's get bit everywhere, whether you call it Twitter or X. <laughs> I know, I'm staying out oh, of that well, one too. Yeah. Uh, you can find me at Anna G News, Anna with one N. I really enjoy your comments. I try to respond to your comments on YouTube in particular. So many of you have these fascinating takes and thoughts that we don't even touch on during the recording of the podcast that make me think like, oh, I wish I'd asked that question. Like, excellent point. So I, I just... I love the interaction with all of you. I really do. And um, we're so blessed to have you all. And it's a community that's rich here, as I call it, the crime family, and rich across the world. We have so many international um, subscribers, and we're so pleased, and we welcome you all. So thank you. I'm appreciative that you give us any time, and um, I know your time is valuable. So you can find this episode, all episodes of our podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. Sub subscribe to our YouTube channel. Sign up for our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. So until next week, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. This is True Crime Daily, the podcast. And as we always say, don't do crime.